Good evening and welcome to the inaugural event of the fall series of public programs at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. My name is Leslie McCall and I'm a professor of sociology and political science at the Graduate Center and also associate director of the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality, which is a co-organizer and sponsor of tonight's event. As many of you may know already, the series of public programs brings together experts from inside and outside the Graduate Center to provide informed and thought provoking commentary on a wide range of important topics of the day. So please be sure to check out the schedule of upcoming events this fall. Each year, a number of these events focuses on issues of particular interest to CUNY students and faculty, and importantly, to the city they serve. By its very name, Occupy Wall Street fits that bill. Last Friday marked the 10 year anniversary of the first day of the occupation of Zuccotti Park. Tonight's panel revisits that momentous day in the city's history, indeed in national and global history. I cannot imagine a better group of individuals to engage in this discussion. Each was involved with Occupy Wall Street in various ways and we're honored to have them join us this evening. I'll introduce them very briefly, focusing on the work that most directly relates to our theme tonight. In alphabetical order, I'll begin with our very own Ruth Milkman, who is moderating the discussion. Ruth Milkman is Distinguished Professor of Sociology and History at the Graduate Center and also CUNY's School of Labor and Urban Studies, where she chairs the Labor Studies Department. She's past president of the American Sociological Association and author of many important books. Her most recent books are a co-edited volume titled Immigration Matters with Deepak Bhargava and Penny Lewis and Immigrant Labor and the New Precariat. In 2013, she co-wrote Changing the Subject, a bottom-up account of Occupy Wall Street in New York City with her, co uh, her colleagues, Stephanie Luce and Penny Lewis. They're currently at work on a follow-up to that study. Suresh Naidu is a professor of economics and international and public affairs at Columbia University. He's also an affiliated fellow at the Santa Fe Institute and the Roosevelt Institute. His work spans a wide range of topics, but most relevant I think for tonight's discussion is his work on the decline of bargaining power among workers, particularly vis-a-vis -vis large corporations and consequently the need for strong antitrust regulations. He organized weekly teach-ins on economics at Zuccotti Park and more generally has been involved in creating educational resources for the public that will contribute to building a more equitable society. Kathy O'Neill is a mathematician and former professor at Barner College. She has worked in the belly of the beast in the financial sector and as an independent data science consultant. She recently founded O'Neill Risk Consulting and Algorithmic Auditing, otherwise known as ORCA. She is author of Weapons of Math Destruction, How Big Data Increases Inequality and Threatens Democracy, which was long listed for the 2016 National Book Award in nonfiction. She is also a regular contributor to Bloomberg View. At Zuccotti Park, she co-founded the Alternative Banking Group, which continues to meet on a regular basis. Last, but by no means least, Nalini Stamp is the National Director of Strategy and Partnerships at the Working Families Party, where she has worked tirelessly to build multiracial grassroots political power since 2008. She worked on the ground at Occupy Wall Street to help bridge the gap between labor, community-based organizations, and Occupy activists. For this and other work, she was given a Champion of Justice Award by the Alliance for Justice and the Edna Award from the Berger Marx Foundation, which honors an outstanding young woman who has made significant contributions to social justice early in her career and whose leadership is creating and inspiring social change. So a very warm welcome and thank you to our guests for joining us tonight. Ruth, I'll turn things over to you now. Okay, great, thank you, Leslie. Um, before we get started, I just want to remind everyone listening that um, if you have questions, we will address those toward the end of the hour, and you can put them in the Q&A in, um, in the Zoom at the bottom of your screen. We, the chat is disabled, but you can use that to ask questions, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, also, the, the recording of this um, event will be posted in a few days, and if you have friends who are interested, you could, you could let them know that. Okay, so as Leslie said, 10 years ago last Friday, Occupy Wall Street was launched. It followed um, tumultuous uprisings around the world, most notably the Arab Spring, 
the um, uprising of the indignados in Spain, and here in the United States, the occupation of the Wisconsin um, state legislature. Participants in the New York occupation of Zuccotti Park included many longtime activists as well as a new generation who were just cutting their teeth politically. None of them expected what followed, a two month occupation that captured the nation's and the world's imagination and transformed the US political conversation and also transformed the participants themselves. Um, the report that Leslie mentioned that I co-authored um, of Occupy changing the subject was meant to convey both those things that it changed the subject in the national conversation, namely to inequality and also changed the political subjects that mattered in the country. Um, so Occupy Wall Street named the problem the nation was facing, namely out of control inequality. And it also named the culprit Wall Street and the 1% and their stranglehold on national politics. It started small and wasn't attracting a lot of attention for the first few days, but then exploded due mostly to the power of social media and the ineptitude of the New York Police Department. Um, I won't detail that, but maybe that'll come up later. Although the occupation of Zuccotti Park ended after two months when the police forcibly evicted the protesters, Occupy launched a new era in US political history. Um, a new wave of protest that has continued ever since from Black Lives Matter, Me Too, to the Sunrise Movement and the Fight for 15, also the Bernie Sanders campaign, the explosive growth of Democratic Socialists of America, signaling a rebirth of progressivism in the United States. Um, Occupy made protest cool again, and the traction it got with the wider public empowered progressives and the broader left. Um, as Yotam, Maram, one of the activists in Occupy, told me and my co-authors, it marked a shift for left activists from righteous losers, he said, to contenders. Occupy cracked something open, he added. There's a new book that just came out on the 10th anniversary by Michael Levitin called Generation Occupy, which makes a similar point. He says, Occupy, quote, gave people permission to take the streets and they've never gone home. Um, the report we did, we we interviewed 25 key activists, most of whom we re-interviewed this spring. They included um, Suresh and Kathy, but not Nalini, which was our mistake, um, but she's here tonight to share her thoughts. Um, we also analyzed the demographics of Occupy, simulating a representative sample, and we found that most protesters were young, college-educated, affluent, and white, with slightly more male than female participants. The driving demographic was what the British journalist Paul Mason called the graduate with no future. Disillusioned young people who had done everything asked of them. When they finished college, they faced the post 2008 labor market. They had been enthusiastic supporters of Obama, but were disappointed when he bailed out the banks, but not regular people. Um, that same generation would lead many of the protest movements that followed. Um, None of our three guests today were present on the first day of Occupy 10 years ago, but all of them, all of you, became deeply engaged soon after. So let's start with your reflections on what the lasting impact of Occupy has been, both on the nation as a whole and on you personally and your particular line of work, Milia. Um, maybe we could start with Kathy. Um, could you talk about how you see Occupy having impacted national conversation and your own work? Um, I'm certainly more comfortable talking about my own work. Um, and I've, I think, uh, you've actually done more of a study on the national implication. Um, I will say that like, I was a mathematician, then a quant in finance during the crisis. I was radicalized about inequality in a personal way by seeing, um, the financial crisis very close up and being friends with people who were in deep debt and listening to the managing directors of the hedge fund I worked at complain about the carried interest tax rate maybe going up because everyone hates them so much unfairly. Um, so it was like a very, very visceral kind of radicalization that I, I went through. Um, 
but I will, I will just, as a confession, to be clear, I was very naive about understanding the context of inequality. Um, so when, when Occupy started, I had already started my blog um, to sort of tell other mathematicians, don't go into finance, it's awful, you'll be part of a terrible corrupt system that is unfair to people. So that's where I was. And I was like, I want to be part of Occupy for sure. And I want to reform the banking system. And I want to talk to people about reforming the banking system um, because we have to do better than this. Um, but when I got to actually talking to people in all banking, which was the group that I helped fi found with the help of Suresh. Um, so I should mention that he found us a room at Columbia that met every, so like we had a room to meet at, which was a huge, huge deal. Um, the conversations, so this is like a long sentence, but like the point is like the conversations that I was witness to, that I observed, that I like took stack um, on week after week educated me about context. So I was just to reiterate, I thought of this as a problem of the rules being wrong, you know, the rules being rigged, the rigged system, and that's not wrong. But what I didn't see, um, and what was I, what I, what I was educated about in the context of these meetings that happened on a weekly basis for ten years, um, was just like the context of power, the context of history, the context of race, um, and gender, and ethnicity, and like I just, I remember the first like maybe 400 times that someone brought up such issues. I was like, guys, can we get back to the point, which is like, how do we reform the financial system? Like, that's what I was thinking. But like, luckily, I didn't say it out loud because you know what I mean? Like after many, many, many weeks, I was like, oh, wait, this is about power. Um, This is about race. This is about gender. This is about all these things. That this is just one manifestation of that. So for me personally, to answer your question, Ruth, for me personally, um, the answer is that um, Occupy educated me. I was radicalized by my ex personal experience in finance, um, but it educated me to, to, to the point where like when I was now then a data scientist instead of a finance person, I looked around at what I was actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis and I was like, oh wait, I'm making all these problems worse. I would not have been able to see that without the education that I obtained in my meetings. So I'll stop there. Okay, great. Um, Suresh, you were already, your eyes had been open prior to 2011, I believe, but could you talk about how um, things changed for you and how your, how economics, your field of study changed as a result of Occupy? Um, yeah, sure. So, I mean, I was a graduate student in economics in the, in the 2000s, but you know, how did I decide to become an economist? It's basically I got tear gassed in Seattle in, uh, during the anti-globalization protest there in 1999. And so I was like a very odd duck inside economics of like, you know, came to it from like an, uh, an activist background and, you know, thought it would, you know, it was important to, to, to uh, argue with economists and, uh, um, and, you know, took it, take, take them, take them seriously and, 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 uh, 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 engage in ideological combat. And, uh, but, and that was like, you know, I think pre, uh, 2008, it's like economics isn't so much conservative despite its public appearance. It's mostly like technocratic. Um, and, uh, uh, and it just kind of, you know, has, this, uh, has an image of itself as, as apolitical. Um, and, you know, one of the things I think, um, Occupy and the financial crisis and just kind of all of the things that came after 2008, I think, there really is kind of a, a sea change in, uh, and I think it's partly generational. It's like, you know, if you hit the labor market after 2008, you probably have a very different vantage point on, uh, uh, on America than if you hit the labor market, you know, before 2008. Um, and, uh, and so I think that's, that's part of, part of that obviously expresses itself in Occupy and part of that expresses itself in, uh, uh, in the broader like generational politics, I think, and uh, uh, that 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 we see along with Occupy. And, you know, I, so I don't know that I'm enough of a social scientist that like, I don't know that Occupy caused all this other stuff afterwards. You know, there's probably were these like big latent 
forces brewing and Occupy was one way they could have manifested and they could have manifested in other things. And, you know, who knows? It's, uh, it's, we only get one run of history and it's very hard to like figure out what causes what. So um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, uh, say anything about, about, uh, about, you know, the, the causal effects of, of Occupy. But I will say that like, A, I think, uh, to be honest, like probably my professional life became easier just in the sense that you could be an out and out leftist now in the world and like it wasn't weird it was like kind of considered important to be work, working on these issues and uh you know I, i'll just say like in 2004 i went to a very prominent economist was like i'm sort of interested in inequality and he's like the only people that are interested in inequality are like the french um <laughs> and, and, and you know he wasn't wrong <laughs> uh, uh uh and and so um yeah, so I think like a lot of these issues became like respectable to work on for better or for worse. I mean, res respectability has its costs. Um, and, uh, 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 and, but then I think the other part of it, um, so I think that it made it easier for, for me to be, for me to like, like work on what I wanted to work on. But it also, I think like in another direction, as, as we've talked about, it's sort of like made me much more, so part of that anti-globalization arc, you know, came with, being an open anarchist. And it's like all of my politics had been, you know, coming out of like anarchist traditions and, uh, uh, you know, like, you know, uh, uh, very much into horizontalism, very much into direct democracy. And I think with, with Occupy, we sort of saw like all the kind of beautiful things that come with those politics, like happening at the small scale and then all the messes that happen when you do that at the large scale um and how you like can't uh, like it is really teed up to to work with people that already have relationships with each other that it can't handle you know like like large inflows of strangers and um and so it made me really much more sympathetic to like bureaucracy <laughs> So, uh, that like in some sense you you like uh, at, at least at this moment in in the U.S. like we just don't have the organic kind of networks that is actually needed to do a horizontalist like mass movement. You need kind of uh, big organizations with staff and revenue and lawyers, and there's like it's very hard to horizontalize your way out of that. Um, so that's sort of like one of the things and I, I always have mixed mind so when I'm arguing with like people that are super pro centralized politics I'm like no no you don't understand and then I'll, 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 I'll argue the other way on a different day um so I think that's that's interesting and, but it's also partly where like my academic work has gone has gone into largely working with the labor movement um as kind of like a vehicle for for uh you know it's like it's the one thing we've got um there was something else I wanted to say but I don't remember so I'll I'll, I'll Okay, well, you'll get another chance. Yeah. Um, well, turning to Nalini, you were already working on the staff of the Working Families Party, though I believe not in your current position. Um, could you talk about um, how your involvement in Occupy changed you and changed New York politics and, and the Working Families Party itself? Yeah, and I also was there day one. I was there before oh, day sorry. one. It's okay. I um, didn't know that. It was, I never went to the general assemblies, but were invited to and went to all the parties afterwards <laughs> in the lead up um, um, towards that. But um, yeah, I had been working, you know, I'm, I'm from Brooklyn and Staten Island, New York, uh, born and raised, um, and had been working at the Working Families Party because the economic crisis affected me personally um, before the uh, financial crash just I couldn't go to college um, because marriage equality wasn't legal and they didn't see my mother's partner as a full person who had multiple sclerosis and no job. Um, I lost all hope in my future and became a high school dropout and did domestic work and retail work. And one day my minimum wage raised. Um, and I was like, who did that? And they said the Working Families Party. They meaning um, Ask Jeeves at the time, not even Google. Um, and I um, started getting involved with the Working Families Party in 2008 when I tried to go to um, to go to college and secure a loan, but couldn't because a lot of banks weren't giving loans without co-signers and half of my family was underwater. Um, and I started working in, in politics and um, Occupy really shifted politics, both like electoral and movement politics, um, both in the state of New York, but also nationally, because before 
people were using digital tools just as like email list or blogs. We weren't actually really, really using the power, the full power of social media, the power of live stream, which we saw in the Arab up uprisings, we saw in Wisconsin, people like, you're live streaming. So the, 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 the beautiful part about direct democracy in that time was that you were also making it so everybody can see it. Not just you in this park, just like if you were there, that's the only way that you can see it, but everybody was able to see it. So for me, you know, what I, watching the shift in New York from this is when the IDC, which some of you might remember, but the original IDC, the original breakaway Democrats were at its most powerful reign. Um, this is when we still have Bloomberg as the mayor of New York after Giuliani's reign. And this is also when police, like one of the things that it shifted, which I think is really important, especially if you had done criminal justice organizing before it, but a lot more people had a different view of the NYPD because September 11th was my third day of high school. I went to LaGuardia High School for the performing arts and um, and people had always, it was always in my family to, to view the NYPD and the FDNY in a specific limelight. They were our heroes. They were what now I would say, you know, is essential workers are the city's he heroes after what happened in the pandemic. But it was, you would never say a bad thing or criticize them in such a public way unless you were doing criminal justice organizing. And for for young kids in a park, mostly white, um, which was a whole nother thing that I can, <laughs> my experience interacting with that mostly affluent as well, which was another thing to be a working class person in that space. Like people had digital cell phones. And I remember being like, I have a flip phone. I can't afford that. <laughs> People were like, go, go on Twitter. And I was like, text to tweet. <laughs> um, but what, what Occupy did, I think the most, one of the most transformative th things was it revolutionized how movements work. Um, before you would use an email, there was toolkits, but there wasn't this like put out a tactic and let the rest of the country take it and, and modify it for their local communities. Right. And then and we saw that. We saw Indivisible do that years later. We saw Women's March do that years later. That doesn't happen without Occupy Wall Street. You don't have organizations like Sunrise Movement start wanting to be distributed organizing, which is this tool that we're all talking about and organizing post Bernie campaign, making it a popular term without Occupy Wall Street um, demonstrating. Um, and, um, and you don't have, this is gonna sound really weird because personally I feel a different way about it now, but you don't also have, um, you don't have Mayor 99%, which what was what de Blasio was called when he ran in 2013, because that race was supposed to be Christine Quinn's to lose, right? And it was because of the movement that he could say it's a tale of two cities, right? You don't have Elizabeth Warren in 20, 2012, the next year beating a, a Republican incumbent, which is damn near impossible, especially in that time, flipping a seat because she was one of the first kind of thought leaders out there to endorse that were that was very known to endorse the movement. Um, and so and you don't have things like, yeah, so I, I, I could go on and on and on. But I just think that, you know, what, you know, the, the term like this could walk so so many people could run is like, what I, I it kind of like clicked into me is like, wait, we walked so Bernie Sanders could literally run for president of the United <laughs> States. Um, and I think that that's something that is, you know, I, I was, I didn't want to claim for a while, but when you actually look at the people who end up in even Bernie Sanders campaigns and Elizabeth Warren's in, you know, in 2016 and 2020 respectively, it's a lot of former Occupy folks who cut their teeth at the ground. Well, that's a perfect segue to what I wanted to bring up next. Um, because as you all know, Occupy famously refused to specify demands. It was also very, um, at least, you know, in the media portrayals, extremely disdainful about electoral politics, partly because of the disappointment with the Obama administration and maybe for other reasons, and, and partly because of the presence of anarchists like Suresh at the time um, in, in the mix. Um, commentators mocked Occupy for all these things. And, and also the fact that Zuccotti Park was um, evacuated, was forcibly evicted after only two months, led, two months is a long time for an occupation, I must say, but still it was portrayed by many commentators as a kind of flash in the pan. So I hope that the three of you could um, respond to, you know, how, how should we re understand 
um, in retrospect, that kind of criticism. And, and what could Occupy have done better? Um, maybe we'll go in the same order again, starting with Kathy. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of agree. <laughs> And I'm not a political scientist and I might be wrong and I hope I am. I mean, I think there's, let me put it this way. I, as a data scientist, as an algorithmic auditor, um, I spend an inordinate amount of time just, just going over the question, what does we mean by success? Um, you know, Facebook means you spend more time on Facebook, get into more fights and hate your neighbors. That's not our definition of success. Um, so it's like, Everything is in that is in that little, if not small detail of what do we mean by success? And if by success, we mean that Occupy was like as successful as the Democratic Party in like churning out uh, candidates that won elections and changed um, changed platforms, then no, I don't think we were like, I don't I just know. Um, but if we, on the other hand, going to the other end of the spectrum of sort of strength of definition you mean like did we change the conversation yes absolutely we did change the conversation um inequality became a thing that people actually said this is wrong now did it it didn't go far enough um i'm, I'm coming out with another book like next year and you know one of the things that sort of infuriates me and saddens me is that we still have just a, an enormous amount of blame and shame around poverty. I mean, that's just a fact about our country. Um, so Occupy didn't succeed in the sense of like really lifting that even around student debt. Like we just, we just aren't there yet. Um, so, you know, it's like, I, I feel like it really is. And I don't want to, I'm not trying to like squirm out of the question. Um, but I do feel like it's all about what you mean by like, what, what, what does success look like? If you define success um, sort of um, in a certain ways, then, then by all means, it was successful. I, I am reluctant to suggest that like, and it's kind of like Suresh, maybe because, because I'm a modeler, like I'm reluctant to claim causality. I do think that, that um, I agree with Nalini that like, when I was at Bernie Sanders rallies, I was like, yes, these, these are the people that I knew from Occupy and that I, and I'm happy to be here. And I feel like, I feel I feel kinship, um, and and for that matter, like I, I agree that a lot of the um, the notion of protests, um, the notion that you can actually possibly make a difference, stems at least from my personal experience from that from that moment. But I, I'm I'm reluctant to say anything more grandiose than that, and it, possibly because I just don't have the data, and I'm kind of data data centered. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Okay, and um, let's turn to Suresh up on this question, and and also what could could Occupy have done things better? What would have would have worked better, if anything? So, so I thought Michael Moore had a really great line during Occupy, which is like the job of Occupy Wall Street is to occupy Wall Street, <laughs> and uh, uh, and you know, and it's kind of wrong, I think, as a principle to think that everything has to do everything, um, and uh, you know, I think you want you 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 know you need your insurgent like like street politics and you need your you know people putting together policy programs and you need your people running for office and like there's a whole ecosystem of organizations that work together and it's often the same people like <laughs> like Nalini it's like you're coming in and out of uh of organizations that are doing like you know real like institutional political work and then at night, you're kind of like in the General Assembly. And so I think it's, it's, um, I, so I think there's like a, a, a real sort of, we shouldn't think of like, like Occupy Wall Street as having to be like the Democratic Party or having to be like another organization. It is, it was its own thing and it, and it did the job that it was supposed to do. And I want to say that some of that job was not like, yes, you know, it was to, you know, have an occupation. But in terms of like seeding networks that persist and like creating, you know, part of the thing about protests that that you know sort of happened over the, over the years is that you wind up seeing the same people again in different contexts, and that like uh, you know is one of the reasons I could really, really easily get involved in Occupy 
even though I wasn't there on the first day, is because so many of the activists that were there, I had known from stuff like five, uh, five, 10 years pre uh, previous and that, or it was one degree of separation away from them. And so it was very easy to figure out what was going on because the, these like social networks had been seeded over like a, over over a while uh, uh, before. And then I, you can see then those same networks go forward and they become the Bernie Sanders campaign and they go into DSA and they, you know, and, uh, and so and I think that's like, that is, that is a success, I think, is like, uh, uh, and ask, like asking it to do more than that is to actually kind of miss the point. And, uh, and I think like, so if in fact, like phrasing demands, I think would have weakened that because it would have forced people into like conversations they weren't ready to have yet around agendas and policies and stuff like that when it like the place it was starting from in you know 2011 it was just not like there wasn't a platform there wasn't concrete policies to 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 that we could like all understood and could have a like sort of reasonable discussion around because the shared basis of trust just wasn't there in that in that community at the beginning and you have to have to build it um uh, like, I mean, I think one of the reasons we started doing these economics teach-ins at Zuccotti Park was because I saw somebody like early on running around with a sign saying like, let's go back to the gold standard. And I was like, what are you guys thinking? And uh, uh, I was just like, okay, we have to, we have to <laughs> up the educational materials here. Um, and, uh, and so, so, uh, uh, so I think it's like, I think it was a total success. And the fact that it um, ended was is sad, but it also did a lot of the work that it needed to do. And, you know, I don't know, for people out there that, that read any like of China Meeble's work, there's this idea of a time golem where like something is worth more as the possibility of what it could have been than it actually would have been worth in practice. Like if it had continued and fizzled out and like just deteriorated into like a mess of infighting and like, like sorted, you know, interpersonal politics, that would have been a much sadder end to it than having the police evict a bunch of heroic occupiers. And so in some ways, like how Occupy ended was worth more than if it had continued. So I can say that out loud now because it's 10 years on and I probably wouldn't have said that a year after, but you know, <laughs> uh, 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 so there you go. Interesting. Nalini, what do you think about these questions? Yeah, so I think um, as an organizer, you're taught like our people make having, like our things changing in people's lives, right? Whether that's policy wise, whether that's condition, um, and I think that like, and that, and that's what I was always taught, like, is something going to change, like chan tangible, not tangible, <laughs> tangible wins for people's lives. And here are the things that I think that folks who, for me, was really interesting are actually the wins that we did have really in that time period that weren't actually in the conversation because um, I think there was a lot of different reasons, but because, you know, I think somebody had said this in the questions is just like, we, it was really hard to have some dialogues because we're living in a inherently a flawed country, right? We're on stolen land that was built by stolen labor. Um, capital, like we're trying to fix, we're trying to bring attention to economic justice and economic inequality in a capitalist society. And so I think that like when we, and I think that the movement does it to this day is that we actually don't acknowledge our wins. So the millionaire's tax was passed in October of that year because people sat outside Governor Cuomo's office and called him Governor 1%. Stop and frisk. And I'm not saying that like these didn't have lineages of organizing, right? But the organizers who worked on those, that was actually the campaign I was working on before Occupy and Occupy made it so we didn't really have to do much before after that. It was a statewide campaign I was working on. So you'll if you talk to organizers, they will say like, what like because so many people were radicalized especially young white kids by police brutality you then have in two years that like the next year stop and frisk ends and there's a big march to end stop and frisk that has a lot of young white kids who would never show up um you have occupier homes that saved i believe as one of the co-founders and 40 homes like it actually saved 40 homes in minnesota and in um, Atlanta. And so when I think about like, like a social movement is really hard to say whether it wins or lose, like social movements are ecosystems. They win, they lose, they do everything actually in between. 
um, because there isn't just one one nexus. Like there's plenty of stuff in the civil rights that won, movement that won, and plenty of stuff that we didn't win, which is why the legacy continues. Um, and so I just, I think that when I think about it from a social movement and organizing perspective, we think about things that are gonna change people's lives. And we do actually think about the conversation changing because that's half of the battle. Um, because culturally, like you cannot have conversations with people um, when, I mean, I can't, can't have, but it's really hard to have organizing and moving people um, to, to, to be involved and agitate them to move people to get involved if there is a huge cultural and difference where people just have a wall. And so the fact that the GOP put out a memo saying, we can't talk about capitalism as a good thing anymore, three weeks into the park, like all of these things, I see them as like small victories. I'm not saying that we went like, we still live in capitalism. I got an iPhone. We're talking on a Zoom, a Zoom that made a lot of money during the pandemic. Like, you know, we still live in capitalism. Um, you know, our big bad now is Amazon compared to Walmart back in those days, right? Besides the banks. Um, but there are things like Dodd-Frank that literally cited, um, you know, Occupy, the like the banking crew that wanted to reform um, um, the banking system. And so I feel like, those are not things that like a movement that's two months that don't have demands. Like those are usually not things that you attach to that. You usually attach all of those victories to like 10 year movements that have different phases and different um, parts of time. And there was actually a lot accomplished in a very little time. And the year later, the fight for 15 starts in our office. Like, and it was like only because of Occupy Wall Street that organizations got together with fast food workers and said, let's go. Um, so yeah, I, I'm measuring it through that <laughs> and I measure it through like seeing what organizers have done since. And to me, that is a success. When you bring more people in, when you change people's lives, that is a success for our movements. And you change people's attitudes as well, change their minds as well as their lives. And, you know, we all have seen the, well, I, I think maybe in the audience too, have seen the polling showing, um, the big increase in the numbers of people who are critical of capitalism identify as socialists. That's something that happened after 2011. And I think Occupy gets at least a big chunk of the credit if insofar as we think that's a good thing. Um, I have another question for you all, but before I ask it, I wanna remind the, um, the participants in this webinar that you are um, invited to put some questions in the Q&A. There are a few there, but very few. So please do that because in about five minutes, we're gonna turn to those questions. Um, so, I agree with what Nalini just said, but nevertheless, I wanna point out another side to the story, which is that for all its achievements, Occupy, and, and, and it wasn't just in Zuccotti Park, I'll remind you, Occupy morphed and replicated itself all over the country and around the world. Um, but it also stimulated a backlash from the right. I, I know everyone listening knows this, here we endured four years of Donald Trump's presidency, who articulated a, a sort of xenophobic, twisted version of Occupy's critique of the rigged political system. Far more extreme reactions have happened um, to uprisings in other countries. Think of what the current state of Egypt, for example, or Tunisia just in the last couple of months. Um, so uh, in that context, in the US with its extreme polarization politically, um, I'd like to ask you all to reflect on the future prospects for Occupy style activism and progressivism more generally. I know it's hard to predict the future. It's even harder than um, not having the data to trace the direct impact of Occupy, but give it a try if you don't mind. Um, can we start with Kathy one more time? Sure. Um, and I would even like go, I would just go back to the Tea Party actually. And like, that, that's the thing that you like, you're like, oh wait, like they actually, did political things um, that you that are more directly traceable, um, mm -hmm. um, and that's and that's hard to disagree with, you know. Um, and and it going back to Suresh's point about bureaucracies, like they also got funding, you know. There there was there was stuff that worked for the Tea Party um, quite quite directly. And again, I'm not a historian, so I'm not I'm not on top of that. I will say though that in terms of like legacies, because it's more, and I think I think it's fair to say that we know that Occupy's effect is more, um, it, it's it's more nebulous. It's more you know, 
environmental, if you will. Like one of the things that I, it occurred to me while you guys were talking, um, Suresh, about the networking that successfully happened because of Occupy and because of other progressive campaigns and what Nalini was saying about stop and frisk, like one of the things that happened to me personally is a couple of years after Occupy, I was at a hackathon, which I don't think would have existed, honestly, these progressive hackathons for data people like myself without Occupy. Um, so I, I think there's a direct path. And we opened up with the NYCLU, the stop and frisk data. And I was I helped them actually like come up with the statistics that were later used in the um, in the judge's ruling that it was unconstitutional as a practice. So like, you know, this is like, this is exciting, right? The, and the, the people I met at that hackathon are the current crop and it's a growing, very growing, quickly growing movement of, of activists within the tech sector. So that's, there's a lot of exciting things happening, which um, if, you know, I will consider it the Occupy legacy, um, but it's not, it's not like, people people won't point to occupy and say like this is what inspired this all um so it's it's a little bit harder to pinpoint but i think um i think you know when you when you look at the the sort of activism going on among the workers in tech right now which is it's is pretty impressive um you know that's the battle that's w being waged right now and it's it's happening um and it's the future and and it's it's growing. So I, I I guess what I'd say is like, Occupy is still having echo effects, although a lot of people wouldn't recognize it that way. Okay, great, Suresh. Yeah. So let me actually um, be a little bit contrarian, um, which is actually that you know I think a, a chunk of the of the um, of the populist right is also animated by many of the th same things that came out of uh, uh, Occupy. In fact, you'll see, like, if you, you, if you chase down Facebook pages of people that were uh, in Occupy, you will find that they're like crazy QAnon people or like, that, you know, that there's, 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 there are also like Trump supporters and stuff. And so I think partly the, the um, and, and so, and I, I actually think it's more of a, uh, of a problem than, than maybe we want to think is that like that, you know, protest kind of partly because it was vague and inchoate kind of got, I think, a lot of people under one banner that then gave you two reactions to, you know, whatever the status quo and one was one was Bernie Sanders and one was Donald Trump. Um, and um, but what's interesting, what I find like, OK, so that's that's kind of what I find interesting is actually the class split in that, um, where it's that really and the, and the race split in that, which is that, you know, it is like amazing to me how much of people without a college degree went for Trump and were also the ones like involved in very like lots of lots of like working class people less so in New York I think than in other than in other places but you know to the extent that there was um like a young a young white like not college educated constituency participating in Occupy I think where a large chunk of them wound up was in the populist right um, and, uh, and not on the left. And so what I then find also interesting about this is also how much like the tactics and like aesthetics and grammar of like protest has been essentially monopolized by college educated people. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and so I just wonder about, um, it's kind of, you know, what, what Piketty calls this Brahmin, this Brahmin left where like overwhelmingly the constituencies back, you know, the biggest, most vocal, powerful constituencies in favor of redistribution of some form are, in fact, like pretty highly educated <laughs> uh, people with with varying economic outcomes. Based, you know, uh, uh, but but I find it um, like, what do you do when you have such a big educational split? Uh, in in you know that I think was like a little bit breached by Occupy, but is like now completely polarized um, on that. And so um, and that that Occupy is like uh, like like the descendants of Occupy are like even more of the highly educated parts, like the tech workers. <laughs> and, uh, and what do you do when like all the people that have that vocabulary are like um, uh, have sixteen plus years of education? Um, 
Nalini, how do you um, un understand the backlash and its relationship to progressivism? Um, <laughs> ooh, uh, I mean, I think that uh, oof, there's a lot to say there. So one is that like, um, you know, we keep talking about, and I, I want to acknowledge this because I think that this is important, but like, especially since I travel to a lot of occupies across the country, I think that like, I really hope that we continue to tell the full story. And mostly it's still, the story that's told is still of the white affluent people of the park, right? Most of the people who wrote books out of Occupy are white men. Um, most of the people who've done like, you know, data and studies and all of that stuff, I, 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 I think it's really important because there were um, a lot of the legacy of a lot of even organizations that popped up right before, like right around Trayvon Martin were a lot of black and brown kids who were involved with Occupy during college. And I think that that story isn't told, but I just know because like Dream Defenders wouldn't be a thing as a co-founder of the Dream Defenders. If like, and the only reason they were like, we need somebody from Occupy, like that's what happened. That's how I got there. So like, I actually have lived that experience. Um, and um, so I do think that's like just important of the context and the setting too, as we're, when we're telling these stories. Um, in terms of the backlash, yeah, I mean, I agree with what Sharesh said. Like, there are a lot of, I know a lot of people who are, I mean, I'll name it. <laughs> They're gonna like Twitter get me tomorrow. But like, you know, you have the Tim Pools and the Glenn Greenwalds of the world that literally have gone to the other spectrum. And there, there is this thing in general, honestly, and it happens honestly, it's not just white working class, like it happens across the board. This is what you see right now with working class men of color who are making the swing because they're targeted with disinformation, right? And so there's like a switch and like these folks, like my, my a, per a family member, not gonna name them that hard, um, you know, went from voting for Bernie to now like being a little anti-vax, right? So there is that, like, there is actually that kind of left to conspiracy because, right, you do not, the inherent distrust of the government, distrust of corporations, just because of our lived experiences, there is a, it's a Venn diagram. And um, so I just think that the, right, so I, I agree that like, there are a lot of people who have gone towards, and it's mostly men, mostly white. Um, I think a lot of them are actually college educated too. Um, it's not just the working class folks. It's like, there are those individual, um, Cele online celebrities or whatever you want to call them or thought leaders right that have made that 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 swing and I think that it is and I mean it's part of one of the reasons why I was back and forth about going to I, I didn't end up going for health reasons but going to the park because there were people who were like we want to have an anti-vax rally um and I was like uh and they were like but it's big pharma we don't trust big pharma and I was like so here's the thing yes I do not trust big pharma and I needed to take vaccines to get to school so let's just you know um so so I say all that to say sorry I feel like I'm rambling but like I feel I, I feel that um there is a Venn diagram of in terms of when we think about our legacy and the backlash like I think that um one of the things that happened and you could see is that we had a movement around economic justice. And of course, because this always happens, once you have a movement about economic justice or, or, or racial justice or gender justice, the next movement is coming along, right? Because they're inspired by, and this has happened over the course of history, labor, gender, you know, like civil rights, labor, gender, civil, it's usually in a cycle. And what we see that happens after, after is like Trayvon Martin dies and so does Ramar Lee Graham. There is a, that start of the movement for black lives, that first spark that continues to rise. And then 2014 comes an uprising around Michael Brown's death. And then right before there's one Trump is running, women start to, you know, talk about patriarchy in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bigger way. And the Me Too movement pops up just before the election and then Women's March. And then, and so we, what I would say is that the backlash is that the reason why we keep having backlashes to that. And the reason why I would even say that right now we have a lot of people in movement that are professionalized, but also probably more of middle class or academic, even upper middle class as well, is because, um, we actually have not had the movement yet in the United States that can bring race, class, and gender into a significant, like a significant that is stapled together 
that we that isn't a laundry list of freaking things, but actually stapled together. And it's what the values of the movement are. We haven't had that movement that centers all three. Um, and I and, and in that I, I am talking about climate. I am talking about all the laundry list of things as well. But until I think we have that, we're going to continue to have this pendulum swing. Um, and it's gonna continue to hit us in the face because when we talk about race and gender and leave out class, people who, right, people don't feel united. And when we do the opposite as well, people don't feel like it's in their, their movement. Okay, thank you. Well, now we're gonna turn to the questions in the Q&A and there are a lot of them, so I know I'm not gonna get to them all. And a few have already been touched on, like somebody asked, um, what? You just addressed Nalini. Do the panelists feel that Occupy set the stage for Black Lives Matter? Your answer is clearly yes. Um, and what? So I'm having trouble deciding which ones to focus on here because there are some really great questions. Um, let's see. One is from someone called Cleo Carol Knopf. Have you followed the specific working groups that formed at Occupy that have turned into longstanding groups like Sane Energy and Moral Mondays? Um, there's one group that Kathy founded that still meets, so that's one example. But do people want to comment on the, you know, the direct, you know, legacy that way? Can you think of other examples? Silence. I'll just mention a couple. Well, you already mentioned Occupy Homes, Nalini, which doesn't exist anymore, but that was definitely an offshoot that lasted for a while. The other one that people in New York might remember is Occupy Sandy, which was enormously important yeah. and um, really brought together many of the Zuccotti Park folks again to deal with an emergency that the city was completely incapable of handling. Um, and they got accolades from all sides. So, you know, that was one example, but. Um, but I, I just, I actually didn't mention Occupy Sandy because it actually like kind of, I think, didn't end well. Uh, and like, you'll know that that didn't come back again, but I think that wound up fraying a lot of those uh, relationships and stuff. And so I think it, uh, it's, it, yeah. So I was gonna, I was thought about mentioning Occupy Sandy, but then I was like, I actually didn't kind of stick around. It's, um. All right, here's another question from the audience. Um, someone named Carol Anshine, pardon me if I'm mispronouncing that, who describes herself as a retired activist librarian. Occupy had a library for those of you who don't know that. Um, a very important feature of it. And it was a feature of many of the other squares movements around the world, by the way. So Carol asks, I, um, she says, I remember visiting Occupy Wall Street, felt the energy of hopefulness. Many people describe that in the interviews we did, by the way, as this sort of magic in the air, this just amazing ex, you know, exuberance that people who participated felt. But anyway, aside from that, um, she says, staff from the Queens College Library was collecting material. Has anyone looked at what they have and do those materials help tell or illuminate the story so far? I would just add that it's not just Queens College. There are a bunch of Occupy archives that have been accumulating over time. They're enormous. Some of them are digital. Some of them are ephemera. Um, does anyone have any feel for that? I mean, that's for future historians mostly, but. I will say that um, I left New York City last summer and cleaning out my closet, I, I have an, I had an archive from all banking, including the 52 shades of greed um, project that we had the playing cards with incredible art that was gifted to us by the artists, um, an artist collective around um, Occupy. Um, I, we had a book we wrote called, you know, um, Occupy Finance. And we had lots and lots of copies of that we had just so many flyers based on our our protests in around like Citibank and HSBC. Um, so just saying, like, if, if there's a good place to bring these archived um, documents, um, I think it I think it is really, really uh, a, a beautiful idea to have it. And by the way, librarians are my favorite people. So um, Carol, <laughs> get in touch with me. Um, I'd love I love to if you're interested, I, I'm interested in talking. Fantastic. Okay, we only have a couple more minutes. So I'm gonna ask, just po point to one more question from Nancy Griffith, which is a little bit of a downer, but I do think it's really important. She asks, 
Is equality inequality the right question? It strikes me that if we all consume equally, at least equal to the American middle class, we can kiss the human race goodbye because global warming will be through the roof. I hope someone will tell me you have a definition of equality that's not based on consumption. Does anyone want to make a stab at that one? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think that it's, uh, there are different models that are not based on consumption. Like there are housing models and there are, um, um, like uh, I think part of it, we have to, not remove ourselves at a mine of scarcity as well is that we have actually like enough housing to house people in this country we just actually have to give it to them <laughs> um and not make them charge an arm and a leg but i will say something that i, I that is that that i do not think that we're ever going to get to qu equality in this country unless we have equity which means that like this goes into the the part of reparations this goes into and i think that reparations can be done a lot of ways i'm not like I'm not the like, everybody gets a check. <laughs> like I think that land, all of these things is land back, right? There needs to be equity for indigenous people, black people um, um, and harmed and, 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 and structurally harmed people that the reason this country has been built for us to even actually have a conversation about equality because equity, like for some of us, we are still going to be 10 steps back because of intergenerational wealth um, and the generational harm that has actually happened. So, and I do, yes, I do think that there is a way to do this out without all just being consumers. <laughs> okay, good. Anyone else wanna say uh, a last word? We have one minute left. Uh, I'll just say it's like, yeah, you know, when I think of like what inequality is and why it's like a useful, statistic it's not because it's literally like we want to equalize the income issue it's a it's it's a it's a diagnostic for tons of the other things that are wrong and so it's like a useful summary uh, measure but it's not necessarily like oh equalized consumption is the thing it's like what you're worried about is like quality of opportunity or like political democracy or like the undue influence of like a small set of people on the lives of everybody else and there's ways of delivering that that i think are consistent with many different levels of consumption. Um, and, you know, but I'll, but I'll also say, I just really hope we decouple quickly because <laughs> uh, um, uh, I, I just don't think there's, uh, if we don't, I don't know that we're gonna be able to sell um, the climate change issue, so yeah. All right, well, that's a very sobering <laughs> note to end on, but we are gonna have to leave it there. I just, um, I know we're not all in the same room except unless you call Zoom a room, but um, I am gonna, on behalf of the larger audience, thank our panelists for all their insights. And um, I hope that we'll be able to continue this conversation in other forums. So thanks everybody for coming and thanks thank to our you, speakers. Thanks everyone. Thank you.